Gear Seekers, I'm Nick. By now, you would have seen a stack of Founders Edition RTX 3080 reviews and videos and somewhat understand how they perform, but how do these cards perform in repeatable benchmarks and does PCIe 4.0 make a difference? Let's find out with this brand new MSI card. Let's make this easy for you guys to understand. I'm going to try not to get too technical because I can see that if I start doing this, most of your eyes are just going to start glazing over. The MSI RTX 3080 Gaming Extria is built on the new NVIDIA Ampere architecture and features 10 gigs of GDDR6X memory with 19 gigs of throughput. In terms of power delivery and consumption, it requires three 8-pin PCIe power connectors and will consume on average around 340 watts at full tilt, but this is only a generalized guide for power consumption, and I don't want to get too off topic at the start of the video, but I've seen it consume upwards of around 375 watts in some tests. So yeah, he does drink a bit of power. As far as testing these new cards, we did a video talking about our new test bench a few weeks ago, and you can check that out up there in the top right hand corner. But we did actually change a few things, and we tested everything across an Intel test bench and the AMD test bench that we showed in that video. And yeah, uh, we only really test the out of the box figures with these GPUs as well, because the truth is a vast majority of users who buy these new GPUs will not overclock their GPUs. We also retested every single GPU we have on hand with both of the Intel test benches and the AMD test bench. And we spent about three or four days doing this. And that's why we didn't really upload that much last week. It's pretty unfortunate timing, but that's just how it goes sometimes with making YouTube videos. In total, we retested about 40 GPUs and we're only including GPUs in this video that we think are relevant to testing for this video. And basically GPUs that you guys have asked to see comparisons with. So that's why we're doing it like this. And on top of that, we don't include 1% highs or lows with these tests because for us, it just introduces a whole lot of extra and unnecessary testing. And I personally feel like if you get an average frame rate, it gives you a good indication of that expected performance. And especially if your system is close to configured the way that our testing hardware is configured. This leads us into the first thing I wanted to address. At the time of filming this video and with the testing that we've done with these GPUs, we found that there's no difference between PCIe 3.0 and PCIe 4.0. Any differences we're seeing are with a margin of error and they're completely negligible. We tested this on both of our AMD test benches where we can switch the PCIe mode in the BIOS from 3.0 to 4.0 and vice versa. And on the Intel bench that we built up, which was on the Z490 RS Extreme with the 10700K. And with the 10700K, we actually yielded better results on average at lower resolutions because of those higher clock frequencies. But at 4K, which is where these new 30 series cards really shine, it didn't make a difference what CPU we used or the PCIe version that we used. We did notice that at 1440p, the benchmarks became a lot more CPU bound, but that's actually to be expected with the change in this architecture. I can already see your eyes glazing over now, right? So let's just jump into some benchmarks before you guys fall asleep. We'll be using these benchmarks going forward with every GPU benchmarking video that we do going forward in Windows. Our Linux benchmarks will obviously be quite different and we use testing that's repeatable and standardized and we don't like doing gameplay testing because those results usually can't be repeated and there's way too many variables and ultimately it's super unreliable and we want the only variable to really be the GPUs in these videos, not a section of gameplay on a certain map for a certain game that you may or may not play. And I know people don't like this, but to be honest, it's accurate, it's repeatable and it's me being honest to you. And that's just the way it is. So with that said, let's kick it off with a classic. Shadow of the Tomb Raider. As I mentioned a bit earlier in the video, at lower resolutions, we're seeing this become a lot more CPU bound. At 1080p, there's no surprises here for me personally. This actually shouldn't surprise you either, given that GPUs at 1080p have been CPU bound for a very, very long time. What surprised me the most was the fact that the jump in performance for 1440p wasn't as significant as I thought it would be given how popular 1440p is and how we've seen performance bumps with previous generations. Don't get me wrong, 19 FPS on average above a 2080 Ti is no joke, but is it enough to make you want to upgrade or fire sell your 2080 Ti like we've seen over the last few weeks? I don't know, stick around to find out. Where the 3080 really shines though is at 4K. These new cards seem to be really built from the ground up at an architecture level for 4K. 
26% uplift in Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 4K is no joke, and that's above a 2080 Ti. Okay, let's move on to Unigen Superposition. For these tests, we performed three tests in total. We use a 4K optimized preset, the 1080p extreme preset, which basically destroys your GPU, and a custom 1440p preset with depth of field and motion blur turned off. Superposition is a great benchmark if you want to get an idea of performance on your own system, as well as that it's a free benchmark, so we use it because it allows you guys to compare your results with ours. So let's get into the first one. First up is the 1080p Extreme benchmark, and you'll notice that this one is actually highly GPU bound. This, this benchmark is an absolute worst case scenario, and we're seeing about a 25% uplift between the 3080 and the 2080 Ti, and around 45% above the 2080. At 1440p, it's much the same. The uplift isn't as much as you'd expect. It's about 16% faster than the 2080 Ti, and around about 39% faster than the 2080. Now, 4K again is more of the same, with the uplift between the 2080 Ti being around 24% on average, and around 46% uplift with the 2080 on average, which is quite a bit, but it's not as much as Nvidia was saying. Next up is Basemark GPU. Basemark gives us a great indication of Vulkan performance since this 3D engine has been designed basically from the ground up to use the low level Vulkan API to really take advantage of your hardware. And I think a lot of people who do these type of videos, they overlook Vulkan, but I think Vulkan is very, very important. It shouldn't all just be about DirectX. At 1080p with Vulkan in base mark, the 3080 absolutely stomps the rest of the cards. It's about 43% faster than the 2080 Ti and about 49% faster than the 2080. And even at lower resolutions, Vulkan is always way more telling of how a card has been designed on an architecture level. At 1440p, the differences are about the same as 1080p, and given what I've already said and what we know about the Vulkan API and how it interacts with your hardware and how it scales, none of this should be a surprise to you. Uh, this is, uh, again, echoed at 4K as well, with those differences still sitting up above around a 40% uplift between the 2080 Ti and the 2080. But let's uh, circle back to Shadow of the Tomb Raider and a new one we've added, Death Stranding. We ran a bunch of RTX and DLSS benchmarks to show you the uplift in ray trace performance and DLSS performance. Although Shadow of the Tomb Raider only supports DLSS 1.0, that's why we added Death Stranding, because it supports DLSS 2.0. But let's go back to Shadow of the Tomb Raider. We ran three different combinations of tests, DLSS enabled, ray trace shadows enabled, and both enabled at both 1440p and 4K. That's a total of six tests. In 1440p with DLSS enabled, we're seeing around an 8% uplift between the 2080 Ti and around about 19% against the 2080. In 1440p with ray trace shadows at ultra settings, we're seeing around 30% better ray trace performance over a 2080 Ti and a staggering 44% better in ray trace performance with a 2080. Wow, that's uh, getting right up there. With DLSS and RT shadows enabled, we're seeing around 26% uplift over a 2080 Ti and around 39% over a 2080. Okay, let's move on to 4K with DLSS enabled. We're seeing around 21% better performance than a 2080 Ti and around 36% better than a 2080. So we're seeing some really, really good scaling here with 4K. With RT shadows, we're seeing around 34% uplift over the 2080 Ti and around 54% uplift over a 2080. The pure ray trace performance seems to be a whole lot better with Ampere at 4K. And lastly, with both DLSS and RT shadows at Ultra in 4K, we're seeing around 26% uplift over the 2080 Ti and around about 41% uplift over the 2080. We're seeing some pretty consistent stompings across the board here. All right, let's move on to Death Stranding. We decided to do a straight up 2080 Ti versus 3080 DLSS 2.0 comparison with both DLSS modes enabled and completely disabling it at both 1440p and 4K with max settings. We're seeing about a 20% uplift on average between 1440p and 4K, and it's it's pretty interesting, but overall, again, there's no surprises here with these benchmarks. We're seeing this across the board.
Now we're gonna move on to some of the most requested benchmark scenarios we've ever received. Some professional workloads. It's, it's the type of benchmark a lot of people will actually overlook, but it's important for people who are buying these GPUs for workstations. So we decided to test all of our GPUs with two Blender scenes, both the classroom scene and the BMW scene, and Premiere Pro render times with our benchmark project that we've featured in the past. First up is the Blender BMW scene, and remember with all of these benchmarks and the rest of the benchmarks in this video, the lower the number, the better. The 3080 absolutely wiped the floor with the 2080 Ti and the 2080. The difference with these render times and compute workloads are absolutely mind-bogglingly insane. Is that a word? I don't care. It's really good. In the classroom scene, we're seeing more of the same, except look at that. We have a surprise contender. The Radeon 7 beat all of the 20 series cards, but that, that 16 gigs of HBM2 helps with compute, but ultimately, it's really not that important because you can't even buy Radeon 7s anymore, so too bad, right? Anyway. All right, I hope your eyes haven't glazed over yet because we're on to the final set of benchmarks, Premiere Pro and Adobe Media Encoder testing. Now, this is an indication of expected performance, and this benchmark is really dependent on the CPU as well, but this is going to give you an idea of what we saw. The render times were actually not that different across the board. They're all within a margin of error with CUDA, but AMD really needs to step up their OpenCL performance. It's not good. Hopefully the new cards will bring more to the table with this, but yeah, we're just gonna have to wait and see. There wasn't enough time to do any acoustic testing, but from our observations with the MSI RTX 3080 Gaming X Trio, it's a pretty silent card, even with our Fermark one hour stress test. And speaking of Fermark, let's look at some of those thermals. We couldn't get the Gaming X Trio above 60C in our 18 degree climate controlled offers. That result is actually fairly impressive, but be aware though, we're running this on an open air test bench and the results in a closed system will no doubt be far different from what we observed when we did our testing. As far as what MSI cards have to offer over the founders cards, you're getting a full size PCB, which may or may not be important to you. You're getting RGB if you're into that kind of thing. You're getting a basically silent card with zero coil wine, which is actually a welcome change for MSI cards. And you're getting a card that doesn't require a new power connector. However, you are getting a card that can suck up to 375 watts of power. You'll definitely need to reevaluate your power situation if you're looking at these new cards, if you have anything under a 750 watt power supply. That's just a recommendation from me to you guys, so just be aware of that. Performance wise, the RTX 3080 is very impressive. The 3080 is looking like quite a big generational leap. This is the kind of leap that we're expecting with the 20 series that we just didn't get, and don't get me wrong, the 20 series cards were good, but they were just far too expensive. That said though, as I predicted, and I've been saying this since the announcement, people really, really need to lower their expectations. All of the benchmarks that we saw from Nvidia and some of the independent outlets were fatally flawed, and they were basically just marketing hype. And here's the numbers to prove it. Now, we knew the 3080 would be a killer card. Don't get me wrong, right? It, it, it's probably gonna be the, the card that most of you are gonna get. It's gonna be that go-to card for many of you. But what I'm more curious to see is if the 3070 lives up to the panic selling 2080 Ti owner's expectations. I guess we're just gonna have to wait like a month or however long it is. But overall, I, I really have to admit, like I'm pretty impressed with what I've seen with the 30 series so far, especially with the performance and that compute power. But whether or not you wanna pay that early adopter tax and jump on board right now, that's completely up to you. Personally, and this is me being absolutely honest, I would just wait and see what AMD has to offer with its upcoming Radeon 6000 GPUs and make your decision after that. But if you don't want to wait, I'd absolutely jump on the 30 series hype train because that train ain't going to stop until the Radian 6000s drop. At the end of the day, like all we're doing is giving you a bunch of numbers that we found with testing. It's up to you guys whether or not you make the decision and if it's something you're interested in and if you think it's something that's worth your hard earned money. Honestly, I can't hold you down. I can't make you do anything that you don't want to do and I definitely can't make you spend any of your own hard on money. If you're interested in grabbing the MSI RTX 3080 Gaming X Trio, 
They're launching when this video goes live for, I actually don't know the US pricing, but for around 1,469 Australian dollars at the time of making this video. And that's all I got to say. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. If you didn't like this video, you know what to do. And hit that dislike button twice. And uh, tell us what you hated about it, of course. Once again, thank you so very much for watching. I'm your boy, Nick with Gear Seekers. You peak. We seek and we have a lot of 30 series builds coming. So you guys need to get really excited. I did want to do this type of review -y video because people do ask us about this stuff and we do have a Linux review coming really, really soon. I just need to work on it because that's going to take another couple days to put all that data together as well. Anyways, guys, I appreciate you very much. Thanks for watching.